Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, happy Monday. So according to our schedule, we do um, Meta on Mondays. Um, just gonna move the chat over here. Um, so uh, Meta practice. The past few weeks, we've been working with essentially abiding in generating states of equanimity. I'd like to go back to kind of the traditional Meta practice a bit. Um, I know that we've been doing that for a while and then, then, then we took a bit of a break. Um, so for those that might be um, newer to uh, that way of working, again, a review. Mm -hmm. All right, so, okay. All right, so um, there's two different ways that I, I like to work with it in terms of um, in terms of um, kind of tr traditional. Uh, sometimes when Buddha would talk about metta practice within the suttas, there would be this, um, I guess, you know, this is the, the form that most people are, are familiar with. Uh, it, it focuses on this interpersonal experience. Um, can you bring to mind a loved one, a, a, a benefactor, a teacher, a mentor, um, somebody for whom it is easy for you to have a positive association? And can you be aware of that quality of kindness, of goodwill generated towards that person? Usually that initial stage is uh, a sense of, um, well, it's kind of inspiring that kindness quality within you. And then from there, we just kind of, you know, uh, uh, as though we're putting different stacks of weights on the, the barbell for increasing the challenge level, can we have that, that kindness towards the neutral person, somebody that it doesn't, when you think of them, you're not inspired to have a, a significant amount of loving kindness. And then after that, moving on to a challenge person, somebody for whom maybe um, some sort of aversiveness may arise or, you know, what have you. Uh, it, whatever inspires the opposite of the state of metta or kindness for you. And again, it's not good to go for the big baddie. Don't, don't jump into the most horrible monster uh, in your life. Um, it, it's essentially about, can we access this capacity for kindness? Can we um, uh, begin to be able to hold it as well? Um, uh, ideally, we can be in a state where if we go back to kind of this this overall theme of can we cultivate a happiness independent of conditions? Yeah, so if I'm here, I'm petting my cat and the cat is purring, I'm just feeling good. There's this natural loving kindness that's being ex exchanged there. Uh, now then I'm next thing happens, my phone rings and I, uh, I'm talking with somebody that may be a boss or maybe a, a, a client that's uh, a, abrasive well, then what happens? Does that normally shut down the loving kindness and then it triggers some sort of you know, negative ego state uh, that, that I might have of feeling um, inadequate or feeling defensive or, or what have you? Um, can I be able to maintain this state of kindness, at least you know, within my own, how shall I say, um, internal environment that I'm creating? Um, it, you know, that might help in some of the defensiveness or some of the, you know, it might diffuse some of the um, unpleasantness coming towards me as well. Um, and it might kind of um, uh, subdue some of the, the, the negative responses that, that occurs. Um, and likewise, you know, it might uh, incline us to begin to open our heart to be able to lean into, recognize the capacity for kindness and, and love that is there. Um, that maybe is not being necessarily expressed to the point where um, it might be appropriate uh, for people in our lives that are uh, people that we care, care about. Um, you know, there's something about when we were younger and uh, children, um, ideally, if they, they have um, a good relationship, they feel comfortable with a family member, they could be very open, loving, exuberant, expressive of that. Um, as we age, we get rewarded for shutting down our emotional centers. You know, it's like, well, we need to show up for work. We need to be even keeled. We need to kind of pack up our personal stuff, leave that at home. So as the years go on, we get rewarded and rewarded for kind of showing up in this kind of emotionally neutral place. 
And um, that tends not to be very um, context specific. Um, you know, it's like if we shut down our heart over here, well then when we go home and it's appropriate to be loving with these people, well, how much can we open it up again? Or does it just kind of open up partially, partially, partially? So sometimes when we talk about uh, emotional regulation, well, you know, something that's expansive that wants to come out and maybe a, a context or an environment that it's not appropriate, how can we inhibit it, inhibit that a bit? Uh, but sometimes um, uh, when we're in an environment where it's appropriate to respond in a particular way, how can we promote that? So the metta practice also helps in terms of promoting um, some of the, the kindness, the love that, um, you know, might be good to have that there in some of our interactions too. Um, so that was just a little commentary on the, um, that, that sequencing steps and stages. Another way that the Buddha likes to talk about um, metta is the radial metta. Uh, and oftentimes I, I like to end uh, these practices with this where um, in the suttas, he talks about radiating um, metta in the different directions, in front, to the right, behind, to the left, above, below, as well as within. Uh, so it's radiating in all directions. So that, that metaphor of the light bulb, the fire, does not discriminate uh, who it shines its light upon. Can we uh, have that capacity to shine um, that metta, that kindness, that goodwill in all directions? Um, uh, towards all beings. Yeah. So just wanted to do a, a bit of a, a meta review. One of the things also when we get, step into that meta stage of the radial meta, it's less about the I-thou relationship. It's less about the, okay, I'm here and I'm thinking about, you know, a family member or a coworker, and I'm, I'm here directing it. Eventually when we kind of step into that radial meta stage, um, it can become a place of abiding, yeah? like a vikara, an abode, a place of, of abiding, where um, that starts to overlap with some of our practices of just resting in awareness, of just resting in this faculty of you know, consciousness that's awake and alive. Well, how can it also have that hedonic tone of, of kindness, of equanimity to it as well? And I think that's a very important uh, uh, important thing to begin to link because as we're moving into uh, other practices that are insight oriented that tend to deconstruct the self. Um, for some people that deconstruction of self can become a little discombobulating because that whole sense of I, me, and mine, we're aware of the, the fading away and the cessation of that. And if that's all that we know and we're just seeing the cessation, that can be very um, destabilizing. But if we can, in our metta practices, uh, begin to touch upon some kind of non-dual states or states of emptying out of self, but there's this exuberance of metta, then when we move in later on into more insight practices where that egoic structure of self begins to um, uh, melt away, so to speak, well, we're already familiar to some degree with an abiding state of awareness that is exuding uh, or the content of it is is uh, kindness and equanimity. So there's a familiarity of being able to rest into that. So that's a way in which um, that type of metta practice can also uh, dovetail in to the concentration as the abiding state and also um, influencing the, the overall flavor of, um, influencing the overall flavor of um, uh, uh, when we rest into an emptiness. So just want to say that much. Any questions before we jump into doing um, an actual practice? I had one really quick. Um, I always, I, I think a lot of people, myself included, always struggle with the neutral person. Um, my mind just gropes around in the darkness for several minutes. Um, and mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had any, <laughs> any suggestions for that. Last time I literally uh, made my, my neutral person a thing a pencil so <laughs> it's just like pick something <laughs> it was effective uh, when the practice was done and you went back to your regular day did it become your favorite pencil it kind of did actually it changed yeah. my <laughs> well <laughs> okay um a few different things came up to mind that i'm totally going to put to the other side um <laughs> 
So ideally, uh, finding a, um, a, a neutral person, and that, that can be a tough one because I think a lot of times when we get into, um, when we get into that whole thing of, of um, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, when we rest into neutral, then we can come across, oh, there's a, actually a subtle preference of actually this is pleasant, and then it moves from neutral to pleasant, or it moves from neutral to unpleasant. So it's tough to find that, um, that neutral person. Um, you know, um, sometimes for me, what I've done is I, I've just allowed my mind to just kind of go through memories, uh, recent memories. I, I know that we're all presently as of the day uh, that we're doing this practice, we're all um, in our respective uh, sheltering in place locations where there might not be a lot of opportunity to bump into people. Um, but, you know, what I do is I, I have my mind usually pass over, you know, people that I might bump into somewhat regularly uh, that I don't really connect with. Um, but I'm, I'm not necessarily averse to either. So somebody in the office place that just never connected with them. Um, they might be nice, they might be fine, but for some reason there's never been a draw towards or a repulsion there. Um, and and I, I, that's kind of a low bar for me, I guess. Um, uh, uh, you know, we don't have to really search for the, the ideal neutral person, you know. Um, you know, right now, uh, since I'm not in an office and I'm sheltering in place at home, you know, I see neighbors walking in front uh, of my home uh, daily. Um, and there's a lot of people that I, I recognize their face and it's like, oh yeah, there's that lady that walks those three dogs and she carries that particular hat all the time. I have no idea what her name is. We probably spoke a couple times when I first moved in, but then at a certain point in time that stopped. Um, she's a great candidate right there. Uh, there's, you know, a, a bunch of people that I, I recognize by face, but um, I have never really connected with. Um, and sometimes... Sometimes for me personally, I might pull the camera back and just kind of uh, go through a Rolodex of like a bunch of people that I might be familiar with. Like as I'm thinking about that person walking the dog, it's just like now my mind is kind of recalling and remembering other, um, uh, other uh, uh, neighbors that walk by or other people uh, that I'm somewhat familiar with. And I think that that's okay. I mean, the neutral person is kind of a low bar because I think that there's probably, once we get into it, there's a lot of people that we kind of might recognize by face only, but don't really have that much information on. Um, but also just ha taking that moment to recognize the humanity that they have as well. Uh, and what is my general tendency? Is my general tendency to be like, oh, I don't know that person. Boom, I can shut my heart down. Now let's look at that. You know? Oh, I don't know that person. Oh, there's a little bit of stranger danger or, or what have you, you know, we can look at what our, our, what's the pattern, what's the reaction that happens, you know, can we still, um, you know, since we're able to do it with an inanimate object, um, it might be a little bit easier to recognize the humanity within um, somebody that's familiar by face. Um, it's funny when you're talking about, you know, doing it towards your pencil and I was like, all right, I'm not going to go in that direction. It's just like, yeah, the, uh, there's all kinds of commentaries of, uh, uh, working with inanimate objects and viewing with different types of powers and such like that. I've heard lots of different people in, uh, uh, you know, especially within recovery settings that might struggle with the higher power that might be like, all right, this rock is my higher power. But it's just like, yeah, anything that we imbue a sense of importance or sacredness to then, you know, kind of, kind of works. Um, but that's a, that's a separate um, conversation. Is, is that helpful? Um, very helpful. I was just really kind of reflecting on it this weekend because um, I was doing some meta practices and um, and just uh, thinking about how, I, I mean, we identify more with the extremes than with, you know, those that sort of neutrality uh, area. Um, and there's different flavors there and um, it's hard to exist in the space between, so to speak. So yes, I was just, yeah. yeah, thinking about that. And But thank you. Yeah, Mike, that really helps. Okay, good. Excellent. Okay, yeah, Rochelle. Sorry, I was, I was a couple minutes late, so I don't know if you already gave the instruction when we do the practice, or maybe you'll give before. Are we going back and forth between the traditional and the radial, or we pick one? Oh, I'll, I'll be leading us through a sequence. This okay. is definitely guided, yeah. Okay. 
yeah, we'll, we'll have a little sample platter of all of it, Michelle. Okay. You know, one thing I have noticed is since the COVID lockdown, when I do neutral person practice, uh, admittedly lately, it's been a lot of it's just been better for self and then maybe uh, close friends. But when I do get to neutral, it's just a lot of the clerks at, at Sprouts. <laughs> you know, those are the only people I see. I mean, that just popped in my head like, well, yeah, who have I been doing lately for neutral? Because neutral is someone you're not normally attached to. You know, you, you use their image and then you just kind of discard it, <laughs> you know? And it's just, I just realized, yeah, it's all been people, you know, the produce person, the, mm -hmm. You know, one of the, the, the clerk that stocks this, the, the whatchamacallit, um, bulk spice rack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Those yeah. are all excellent. So if anybody has uh, a lack of neutral people, just see Juan. He, <laughs> he's got a good list of... When in doubt, go into the Mr. Rogers, who are the people in your neighborhood? Yeah. <laughs> oh, right, like, oh, yeah. yeah like, <laughs> the, who are the only people you see nowadays? The occasional person walking the dog? Or... Mm -hmm. so the post person <laughs> those are all excellent yeah. okay very good um all right allow yourself to come to a comfortable upright position yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Allow yourself to straighten up and settle in. We'll be doing a bit of metta practice today, but we can start off with some simple contact with the breath to help settle the mind, cultivate shamatha and concentration. To allow yourself to find your way towards the breath, contacting a part of the body that directly is engaged in the breathing process. Noticing not only the mechanical entering and exiting of air, but priming ourselves a bit as we're about to enter into metta. Can we notice any hedonic tone associated with breath? any pleasant emotive tone that occurs on the inhale. Maybe subtle or fleeting, but there could also be a pleasant, joyful quality. And on the top of that in-breath, that fullness may be able to carry or hold some pleasant quality that expresses itself in a fullness. The exhale, there can be a relaxation or relief. At base of the exhale, there can be a simplicity, relinquishing a contentment. Just allow yourself to be open to recognizing and feeling any of the pleasant feeling qualities associated with the various stages of breath.
Very good. And remember that breath is always something you can return to or you can take with you. So we transition into metta practice. So traditionally, we start off with uh, the beloved. So bring to mind somebody for whom it is easy for you to connect with some pleasant feeling. Does it bring them to mind? Does it open the heart in some way? A loved one, a family member, a pet, a mentor, a benefactor, can bring that one to mind. And is to say, allow that image to arise in sea space or just be aware of them. And partial awareness and feel space. Just notice, does that incline the feeling experience to have a bit more of an opening, a softening, a sense of kindness, goodwill, acceptance, appreciation. Just permit that, allow that. The image or the awareness is one thing, but really the main thing that we're trying to connect with is the feel-in quality that can arise in the body. And can we continue to cultivate that? As we are aware of any degree of metta, kindness, goodwill, can we also have a sense of uh, being able to Of being able to promote it, meet that with an appreciation. So part of working this way is, can we recognize the pleasant quality of metta that arises? Can we recognize where it arises in the body, how it arises? Can we permit it, allow it? Any part that wants to expand, allow it. Any part that wants to contract, allow it. 
and give yourself permission to enjoy that experience or appreciate it, which can create another moment of pleasant. You can lean into, appreciate, which can create another moment. So it begins to build. There's this momentum, this positive feedback loop that can begin to build here. Okay, good. So we can let go of that, the loved one. I mean, you can bring to mind the neutral person, someone for whom it is for you. There is no preference for or against. The individual can be random, someone that you maybe come across with, with some regularity or not. If they come to mind, does that diminish the metta, the goodwill? Can you still be able to hold, cultivate the qualities of openness, kindness, acceptance? You can also explore and recognize the humanity of that individual. They too are deserving to be free from harm and free from suffering. That individual as well can benefit from happiness and peace. Can we offer that as we keep that individual in mind? Well, we continue to cultivate that within the body and heart.
Okay, good. So you can let go of that and now bring to mind the challenge person. Don't go for the big baddie in your life. It may be somebody that um, when they come to mind, it doesn't inspire kindness. Maybe you can watch that heart recoil a bit. Or can the heart stay open? And you can play this one of two ways. Maybe as you are aware of that challenged person, you could recognize that maybe some of their unskillful and unpleasant behavior is an expression of their own unskillful way of working with their suffering. Maybe they too deserve to have a decrease in their suffering. Maybe they be free from harm, free from suffering. Or maybe if that doesn't feel appropriate to you. And it feels more appropriate to have that boundary uh, in place of safety between you and them. Can you still work on cultivating your own metta, arising within your body, arising within your self-experience? As though this metta can have an increased resiliency. You can tolerate being in the space of that unpleasant individual. We can notice our habit patterns of reactivity, defensiveness, or what usually arises. If any discomfort of the heart arises, can we extend that compassion to ourselves? And to whatever degree it feels appropriate, extend that to the challenge, the challenge person. Okay, good. We can let go of that. Now just focus on your own experience. To whatever degree a metta is active, a sense of kindness, of goodwill. That pliancy, that flexibility, moving between compassion and appreciative joy and overall capacity for acceptance equanimity whatever flavors are most salient for you recognize them give yourself permission to feel them whatever is pleasant about it and you meet that with appreciation acceptance which may create this positive feedback loop
And can we offer this metta outward? In all directions. Like the light bulb that does not discriminate where its light shines upon. Can we extend this metta outward? Into space in front of you. To the right of you. Behind you. To the left of you. Above and below. It's this expansive quality of metta that radiates outwards into space towards all beings. And not only is there the expansive quality, but can there be the contractive quality as it also collapses inwards towards you? Recognizing that all of this metta being directed outward by everybody here, that you too are receiving the metta from everybody within this particular collective of individuals practicing metta, but also those practicing metta in other locations around the world. And by extension, those practicing metta at other times in the past and the future. Can we allow yourself to be open, receptive, to receiving the metta that's coming towards you from these different locations and times? Allowing yourself to fill up. Maybe taking down whatever residual defenses remain. To allow yourself to take in the metta that is available around you.
Okay, at ease everybody, recognizing post bell practice, allowing yourself to uh, not shut down what you've generated. To some degree, can you hold that state with eyes open? Of course, it'll diminish somewhat, but um, still allowing yourself to be in a position to receive the merits of the efforts here. I've generated. So, what did you notice? What did you observe? What was relevant for you in this morning's practice? I'll go. Um. For the um, neutral, you know, I, I, I went, as you said, around the neighborhood and we walked by a family yesterday um, that I see often the dad skateboards around the block. And, you know, for me, a lot of the neutral, it's like I, I'm always curious about people, right? So I like want to know more about them. So it's usually the opposite of, it's like, um, it's more of a uh, a pleasant go to rather than like an unpleasant for the neutral. So um, we, I always see him, and I'm always curious, like where did he learn to skate? And then um, the he he skateboards with his son. But then yesterday we walked by him, like we were both families were for a walk, and in my meditation it came up that like. Sometimes I'm a little, um, have a little intuition of people that like, I don't, I don't want to judge them. It just like comes to me. And th this guy had like a dark sense about him. So I was trying to like generate my meta to like alleviate that feeling and to just create that neutral, pleasant, instead of, mm. I don't want to use the word judging because I'm not judging. It's like what I felt, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was interesting. Mm. And how did that go? What took place? It was it was okay, and then I I I didn't get to where I wanted to go because I kept on telling my like I kept on feeling that darkness, and I'm like, well, it is what it is. Like if that's what you're feeling, like you need to be aware of that. You can't just like dismiss that feeling, and like pretend like everything's okay. You know, like like let's just say I'm like, oh oh he's fine. Like let's get a get together. You know, and then all of a sudden I'm like, wait, like and then. It, my mind kind of wandered where my mother did this years ago. She said to me, she's like, Lisa, that guy doesn't look, he's not okay. It was like a, a cousin, uh, uh, my husband's cousin. I'm like, no, he's fine. He's so nice. And he wound up like beating his wife. So it's like, okay, my mom was onto something. Mm -hmm. So it's like that. You don't want to not listen to that intuition. At the same time, you don't want to like judge the unpleasant feeling. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it was a struggle for me in the neutral. Yeah. So that's an interesting point. A lot of times when I speak to people that um, consider themselves very intuitive or empathic, uh, um, a, a challenge that they may have is a feeling of kind of taking on all of those feelings that they have, that they're walking around like a kind of an emotional sponge taking on other people's stuff. I know that's not exactly what you're saying, mm. but there is something about that entering into somebody's space, being able to draw in or feel something, and it can be unpleasant. And what do you do with that? So the fact that, um, you know, you have this kind of intuitive experience of that individual, there's this kind of unpleasant darkness, as you say. And then, yeah, you don't want to judge or shut them down. You know, who knows that could actually be a, a very nice individual in your neighborhood. But at the same time, there is something unpleasant there that has entered into your awareness and your emotive experience so how to still kind of have like an internal boundary of being able to you know not have that colonize your experience but still be able to have some resiliency of oh, okay that's what that experience is and I can let go of that and still have my own uh, experience still have my own um, 
in this case, cultivation of your uh, sense of metta and well-being. I think that's an, that's an important thing to have uh, for anybody that considers themselves intuitive, empathic, sensitive. Um, we can kind of get a sense of things. And if we're aware of some unpleasantness or negativity around, uh, how to have some kind of boundary around that so we can let that go. I think is it's important to be able to be aware of that and your own sense of well-being and be able to continue to promote your own sense of well-being. I think that that's um, I think a necessary skill as well of anybody that's in the helping professions too mm -hmm. uh, to be able to do that. It's cool. Thank you for spotlighting that, Lisa. Anybody else? What happened for you this morning? Yeah, Rochelle. Um, that's funny. I wasn't planning to share, and suddenly my hand was up. Um, I, I actually had a similar experience, but with the challenging person, I thought of somebody at work, right? A colleague who for, you know, actually a couple decades has been extremely difficult. And my first, and not to me, not a kind person, very greedy, competitive, you know, out for himself, out for what he can get, et cetera. And actually, my first thought was, I haven't seen him now in months, having been on lockdown, right? And so I was like, I don't even want to think about him. So I shifted to, I tried to do something about his assistant, who can really be a, excuse me, bitch. And even there, I, I didn't quite, it was like, you know, those people, I haven't seen them in months. Let's just kind of leave that head out. And I shifted to a neighbor whom I'd been friendly with over uh, quite a while, living here more than, or going on 20 years, I guess. And recently she's been more and more vocal about some of her longtime beliefs, which are not exactly anti-Semitic. I mean, I'm Jewish, but um, along those lines, right? So it was very difficult. And I felt like I, I, I want to be able to be kind and be nice. She's a neighbor, right? You know, and you know, I've, I've watered her plants when she's away. I brought in her mail. We've had conversations. She's very cultured, and it, it was it was tough. There was part of me that didn't even want to shift into a kinder, holding her with kindness. Mm -hmm. You know, and part of me really did want to because I thought that's that's a good challenge. You know, and yet on the other hand, I was like, yeah, I'm not sure I want to. And, you know, I, I think that's probably a good challenging one for me because we're all kinds of people on the planet, you know, and sometimes people that you've known for a long time, you know, like Lisa, you might get that feeling of the darkness or whatever. It's it's not that with her. And I agree, Lisa, you need to like, respect that feeling and not just meta it away so to speak but anyway it was it was useful yeah thank um, you it's it's interesting because um yeah we, we, I, I like how you said there's all so kinds of people in this world rochelle and we are in community and it's like on one hand for for so long you know there's been so many conversations about people feeling outside of community and not in community and of course you know the majority of us live in large um, communities, whether that's just a, a town or a city where it, it's hard to have a sense of any community so much as just a, a, a mass amount of individuals just kind of fending for themselves. Um, so I think that it's necessary for us to have a sense of community. Yet within any community that we have, whether it's the local neighborhood or the community of work, um, there's lots of people there's all different types of people and people that we might disagree with and people that might uh, rub us the wrong way. Uh, we can disagree with um, in views or they can be uh, somewhat unpleasant. So yeah, how is it that we can be in community? Um, and especially these times where it just feels like every year, you know, overall, you know, people are getting more um, polarized and viewing each other as the other or as the, on the other side of whatever they hold uh, to be of value. Uh, and there seems to be such this, um, you know, rage just seems to be such a um, trend these days. Um, 
and of course, a lot of it is is well merited. A lot of uh, social change needs to take place, and that can't happen without a, a, a significant amount of okay, I'm not going to take this anymore. But it, it feels like there can be a lot of unuseful um, sense of opposition and um, judgment and harshness upon others and our, our neighbors. Um, so yeah, how is it that we can extend and cultivate community uh, when there are many people that have different views and maybe a lot of unskillful living of those views too? Um, so when you hold them in mind, you know, it, it can get very complex. There's that sense of, okay, there's kind of the darkness again, referencing uh, Lisa, your share, right? How to kind of respect, be aware of that, cultivate your own um, meta. And then Rochelle, it sounds like, all right, is there some degree of kind of forgiveness that needs to take place with that individual? And maybe to what degree? Uh, again, to also respect your own sense of your own boundaries too, how so that you can keep your own meta alive, maybe look at having some forgiveness or flexibility around this individual. Um, yeah, without getting into a lot of the dynamics of that, it, it can get very, quite complex. So how is it that you can um, keep your um, mind and heart open and also at the same time not lose your own critical thinking and ability to take care of yourself? Yeah, it's, um, it can get quite complex. Um, what I want to say, you know, a lot of the metta practices, you know, we're, we don't want to, the, the goal is not to just walk around like a Buddhist doormat and just think that everything is kind and lovely and flower and perfume and that you know, as a result, we get stepped on and, and walked on. Uh, it's important that we still hold our, our boundaries. Uh, it's important that we still uh, advocate for ourselves. Um, but I think a lot of it is to just go back to the core um, teaching of suffering and the cessation of suffering. How can we show up in this interpersonal space with diminished suffering? Um, so a lot of that is in the, the challenge person. How is it that we can hold and, and maintain our own self-care and cultivation of our own uh, metta? And if what happens when we're in the face of the other, and it's a lot of unpleasant, a lot of pain, how can we recognize that and, and have a lot of self-directed compassion? And also, can we see maybe some of our reactivity might be coming on a little too strong? How is it that we can kind of maybe soften up where that's appropriate? How is it that we can extend some uh, forgiveness towards the other where it's appropriate? Uh, so, yeah. Um, the metta practice um, in this way is, is different from the other practices of shamatha, vipassana, etc., because it's not as present time oriented because we're, we're, we're still working on this kind of superficial phenomenal level, level of phenomena of concepts of ideas. I'm just picking this person out of, an, uh, of a memory. I'm doing this. So there's a lot of thinking, but can we still have partial awareness tethered to the real time uh, experience of what's arising in, in the heart and being able to tend to that in real time? Um, so in one part, there's this, we're dealing with phenomena and concepts and ideas and it's superficial, but then there's that, um, deeper being able to rest into our authentic experience. And then the, the final part of the meditation, how so that we can just abide in that as, um, as less of an I thou state, just kind of radiate it. Because sometimes it's appropriate and preferable to just hang out and radiating meta as opposed to just suffering along in our own ruminations and judgments. All right, so uh, one eye on the clock, I went over a little bit, but um, I appreciate everybody's uh, efforts this morning. So homework, life practice, as you go through the day, what's taking place, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, can there be some degree of metta kindness within uh, your response uh, to the pleasant, the unpleasant, the neutral? That could be with individuals uh, that you're interacting with and for many of us who are in isolation, maybe those individuals are only existing in concepts and memories, but still, uh, can there be some degree of metta, some degree of uh, kindness? Uh, and whether that works into a compassion towards your own discomfort or an appreciation of whatever pleasantries arise, just lean into that. Okay. All right, thank you, everybody. Have yourselves a wonderful day. Hope to see you all tomorrow. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Good day. Bye.